Milton. Read by Adriana Díaz Enciso. Part 1. Milton. To justify the ways of God to men. The stolen and perverted writings of Homer and Ovid, of Plato and Cicero, which all men ought to contemn, are set up by artifice against the sublime of the Bible. But when the new age is at leisure to pronounce, all will be set right. In those grand works of the more ancient and consciously and professedly inspired men will hold their proper rank, and the daughters of memory shall become the daughters of inspiration. Shakespeare and Milton were both curved by the general malady and infection from the silly Greek and Latin slaves of the sword. Rouse up, O young men of the new age! Set your foreheads against the ignorant hirelings. For we have hirelings in the camp, the court and the university, who would, if they could, forever depress mental and prolong corporeal war. Painters, on you I call, sculptors, architects, suffer not the fashionable fools to depress your powers by the prices they pretend to give for contemptible works or the expensive advertising boasts that they make of such works. Believe Christ and his apostles that there is a class of men whose whole delight is in destroying. We do not want either Greek or Roman models if we are but just and true to our own imaginations. Those worlds of eternity in which we shall live forever in Jesus our Lord. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountain screen? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And while Jerusalem builded here, among these dark satanic mills, bring me my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire, bring me my spear, O clouds unfold, bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental height, nor shall my sword leap in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets. Milton, Book the First Daughters of Beulah, muses who inspire the poet's song, record the journey of immortal Milton through your realms of terror and mild moony luster and soft sexual delusions of varied beauty to delight the wonder and repose his burning thirst and freezing hunger come into my hand by your mild power descending down the nerves of my right arm from out the portals of my brain whereby your ministry the eternal great humanity divine planted his paradise and in it caused the spectres of the dead to take sweet forms in likeness of himself. Tell also of the false tongue, vegetated beneath your land of shadows, of its sacrifices and its offerings, even till Jesus, the image of the invisible God, became its prey, a curse, an offering, and an atonement. For that eternal in the heavens of Albion, and before the gates of Jerusalem, his emanation in the heavens beneath Beulah. Say first, what moved Milton, who walked about in eternity one hundred years, pondering the intricate mazes of providence, unhappy though in heaven? He obeyed, he murmured not, he was silent. Viewing his sixfold emanation scattered through the deep in torment. To go into the deep hair to redeem and himself perish? What cause at length moved Milton to this unexampled deed? A bar's prophetic song. For sitting at eternal tables, 
terrific among the sons of Albion, in chorus solemn and loud, a bark broke forth. All sat attentive to the awful man. Mark well my words. They are for your eternal salvation. Three classes are created by the hammer of loss, and woven by Edith Armand's looms, when Albion was slain upon his mountains, and in his tent, through envy of living form, even of the divine vision and of the sports of wisdom in the human imagination, which is the divine body of the Lord Jesus, bless forever. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. Your reason lay in darkness and solitude, in chains of the mind locked up. Lost is his hammer and tongs. He labor at his resolute anvil among indefinite druid rocks and snows of doubt and reasoning. Refusing all definite form, the abstract horror roofs, stony heart and a first age pass over in a state of dismal woe. Down sank with fright a red round glow, hot burning, deep, deep down into the abyss, panting, conglobing, trembling, and a second age pass over in a state of dismal woe. Rolling round into two little orbs that close in two little caves, the eyes beheld the abyss. Lest bones of solidness freeze over all, and a third age pass over in a state of dismal woe. From beneath his orbs of vision, two ears in close volutions shot, spiring out in the deep darkness, and petrified as they grew. And a fourth age passed over in a state of dismal woe. Hanging upon the wind, two nostrils bent down into the deep. And a fifth age passed over in a state of dismal woe. In ghastly torment sick, a tongue of hunger and thirst flamed out. And a sixth age passed over in a state of dismal woe. Enraged and stifled without end within, in terror and woe, he threw his right arm to the north, his left arm to the south, and his feet stamped the neither abyss in trembling and howling and dismay. And a seventh age passed over in a state of dismal woe. Terrified, lost too in the abyss, and his immortal limbs grew deathly pale. He came what he beheld. For a red round cloak sank down from his bosom into the deep. In pangs, he hovered over it, trembling and weeping. Suspended, it shook. The neither abyss in tremblings, he wept over it. He cherished it in deadly, sickening pain. Till separated into a female pale, as the cloud that brings the snow. All the while, from his back a blue fluid exuded in sinews, hardening in the abyss, till it separated into a male form howling in jealousy. Within, laboring, beholding without, from particulars to generals, subduing his specter, they builded the looms of generation. They builded great Golconusa times on times, ages on ages, First orc was born, then the shower the female, then all lost his family. At last an Armon brought forth Satan refusing form. In vain the miller of eternity made subservient to the great harvest that he may go to his own place, prince of the starry wheels. Beneath the plough of Rintra and the harrow of the Almighty in the hands of Palamabrum, while the starry mills of Satan are built beneath the air the waters of the mundane shell. Here the three classes of men take their sexual texture woven. The sexual is threefold. The human is fourfold. If you account it wisdom when you are angry to be silent and not to show it, 
I do not account that wisdom but folly. Every man's wisdom is peculiar to his own individuality. O oh, Satan, my youngest born, art thou not prince of the starry hosts, and of the wheels of heaven, to turn the mills day and night? Art thou not Newton's pine to crater weaving the woof of a lock, to mortals mills in everything, and a harrow of shaddai, a scheme of human conduct invisible and incomprehensible? Get to thy labors at the mills and leave me to my wrath. Satan was going to reply, but Los rolled his loud thunders. Anger me not. Thou canst not drive the harrowing pity's path. Thy work is eternal dead, with mills and ovens and cauldrons troubling no more. Thou canst not have eternal life. So Los spoke. Satan, trembling, obeyed, weeping along the way. Mark well my words. They are of your eternal salvation. Between South Moulton Street at Stratford Place, Calvary's foot, where the victims were preparing for sacrifice their cherubim, around their loins poured for their arrows and their bosoms been, with all colors of precious stones, and their inmost palaces resounded with preparation of animals wild and tame. Mark well my words, Corporeal friends are spiritual enemies. Mocking druidical mathematical proportion of length, bread, height, displaying naked beauty, with flute and harp and song, palamabron with a fiery harrow in mourning returning from breathing fields, Satan fainted beneath the artillery, Christ took on sin in the virgin's womb, and put it off on the cross. All pity the piteous, and was wrath, wrath, and loss, heard it. And this is the manner of the daughters of Albion in their beauty. Everyone is threefold in a head and a heart and reins, and every one has three gates into the three heavens of Beulah, which shine translucent in their foreheads and their bosoms and their loins, surrounded with fires unapproachable. But whom they please, they take up into their heavens in intoxicating delight. For the elect cannot be redeemed, but created continually. By offering an atonement in the cruelties of moral law. Hence the three classes of men take their fixed destinations. They are the two contraries and the reasoning negative. While the females prepare the victims, the males at furnaces and anvils dance the dance of tears and pain. Loud lightnings lash on their limbs as they turn the whirlwinds loose upon the furnaces, lamenting around the anvils, and this their song. Ah, weak and wide astray, a ah, shot in narrow, doleful form, creeping in reptile flesh upon the bosom of the ground. The eye of man, a little narrow orb, close up and dark, scarcely beholding the great light conversing with the void. The ear, a little shell in small volutions, shutting out all melodies and comprehending only discord and harmony. The tongue, a little moisture feels, a little food it cloys, a little sound it utters, and its cries are faintly heard. Then brings forth more over to the cruel Babylon. Cut such a night, Josh of the stars, and looking through its tubes measure the sunny rays that point her spears on Ud and Adam. Can such an ear fill with the vapors of the yawning pit, Josh of the pure melodious harp struck by a hand divine? Can such close nostrils feel a joy, or tell of autumn fruits, when grapes and figs burst their covering to the joyful air? Can such a tongue boast of the living waters, or take in aught but the vegetable ratio and loaf the faint light? Can such gross lips perceive, alas, folded within themselves, they touch not aught but pallid turn and tremble at every wing? Thus they sing, creating the three classes among druid rocks. 
Charles calls on Milton for atonement. Cromwell is ready. James calls for fires in Golgonusse, for heaps of smoking ruins in the night of prosperity and wantonness which he himself created. Among the daughters of Albion, among the rocks of the Druids. When Satan fainted beneath the arrows of Elinitria, and mathematic proportion was subdued by living proportion. From Golgonusa the spiritual fourfold London eternal in immense labors and sorrows ever building, ever falling through Albion's four forests which overspread all the earth. From London stone to Blackheath east to Hounslow west to Finchley north to Norwood south and the weights of any Tarman's loom play lulling cadences on the wings of Albion. From Cave in the north to Lizard Point and Dover in the south. Loud sounds the hammer of laws, and loud his bellows his hair. Before London to Hampstead Press, and Highgate's Heights to Stratford and Old Bow, and across to the gardens of Kensington, on Tyburn's Brook. Loud groans stems beneath the iron forge of Rintra and Palamabum of the Otormon and Bromion to forge the instruments of harvest, the plough and the harrow to pass over the nations. The sorry hills glow like the clinkers of the furnace. Lambeth's Vale, where Jerusalem's foundations began, where they were laid in ruins, where they were laid in ruins from every nation and oak groves rooted, dark gleams before the furnace mouth, a heap of burning ashes. When shall Jerusalem return and overspread all the nations, return, return to Lambeth's veil, O building of human souls? Then stony through the temples overspread the island white, and thence from Jerusalem ruins, from her walls of salvation and praise, through the whole air, were reared from Ireland to Mexico and Peru west, and this to China and Japan, till Babel. The spectre of Albion frowned over the nations in glory and war. All things begin and end in Albion's ancient, druid, rocky shore. But now the starry heavens are fled from the mighty limbs of Albion. Loud sound the hammer of laws. Loud turn the wheels of any tarman. Her looms vibrate with soft affections weaving the web of life out from the ashes of the dead. Loth lifts his iron ladles with molten ore. He heaves the iron cliffs in his rattling chains from Hyde Park to the almshouses of Mile End and Old Bow. Here the three classes of mortal men take their fixed destinations, and hence they overspread the nations of the whole earth and hence the web of life is wooden, and the tender sinews of life created, and the three classes of men regulated by losses hammer. The first, the elect from before the foundation of the world. The second, the redeemed. The third, the reprobate and formed to destruction from the mother's womb. Follow me with my plough. Of the first class was Satan, with incomparable mildness. His primitive, tyrannical attempts on loss, with most endearing love, he soft entreated loss to give to him Palamabron's station. For Palamabron returned with labor wearied every evening. Palamabron oft refused, and as often Satan offered his service till by repeated offers and repeated entreaties, Loth gave to him the harrow of the Almighty. Alas, blameable Palamabron feared to be angry, lest Satan should accuse him of ingratitude, and Loth believed the accusation through Satan's extreme mildness. Satan labored all day. It was a thousand years in the evening, returning terrified, over-labored and astonished, embraced soft with a brother's tears, Palamabron, who also wept. Mark well, my words, 
they are of your eternal salvation. Next morning Palamabron rose. The horses of the harrow were maddened with tormenting fury, and the servants of the harrow, the gnomes, accused Satan with indignation, fury, and fire. Then Palamaron, reddening like the moon in an eclipse, spoke, saying, You know Satan's mildness and his self-imposition, seeming a brother, being a tyrant, even thinking himself a brother while he is murdering the just. Prophetic, I behold his future course through darkness and despair to eternal death. But we must not be tyrants also. He had assumed my place for one whole day, under pretense of pity and love to me. My horses had he maddened, and my fellow servants injured. How should he, he, know the duties of another? Oh, foolish forbearance! Would I have told love all my heart? But patience, O oh my friends, all may be well. Silent remain, while I call loss and Satan. Loud as the wind of Beulah that unroots the rocks and hills, Palamabron called. And loss and Satan came before him, and Palamabron shoe the horses and the servants. Satan wept. And mildly cursing Palamabrum, him accused of crimes himself had fought. Lost tremble. Satan's blandishments almost persuaded the prophet of eternity that Palamabrum was Satan's enemy, and that the gnomes being Palamabrum's friends were leagued together against Satan through ancient enmity. What could Lost do? How could he judge? But Satan self believed that he had not oppressed the horses of the harrow nor the servants. So Lost said, Henceforth, Palamarum, let each his own station keep, nor in pity falls, nor in officious brotherhood, where no needs be active. Meantime, Palamabron's horses, raged with thick flames redundant, and Harrow maddened with fury. Trembling, Palamabron stood, the strongest of demons tremble, curving his living creatures. Many of the strongest gnomes they beat in their wild fury, who also maddened like wildest beasts. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. Meanwhile wept Satan before laws, accusing Palamabrum, himself exculpating with a mildest speech, for himself believed that he had not oppressed nor injured the refractory servants. But Satan, returning to his meals, for Palamabrum had served the meals of Satan as the easier task, found all confusion and back returned to loss, not filled with vengeance but with tears, himself convinced of Palamabrum's turpitude. Loss beheld the servants of the meals drunken with the wine and dancing wild with shouts and palamarin songs, rending the forest green with the echoing confusion, though the sun was risen on high. Then Loss took off his left sandal, placing it on his head, signal of solemn mourning. When the servants of the meals beheld the signal, they in silence stood, though drunk with the wine. Loss wept, but Rintra also came, and the Nitarman on his arm leaned tremblingly, observing all these things. And Loss said, Dear Jenny of the Mills, the sun is on high, your labors call you. Palamabron is also in sad dilemma. His horses are mad, his harrow confounded, his companions enraged. Mine is the fault. I should have remembered that pity divides his soul and man and man's. Follow me with my plough, this mournful day must be a blank in nature. Follow with me and tomorrow again resume your labors, and this day shall be a mournful day. Wisely they followed Loss and Rintra, and the meals were silent. They mourned all day this mournful day of Satan in Palamabrum. 
and all the elect and all the redeemed mourned one toward another upon the mountains of Albion, among the cliffs of the dead. They ploughed in tears, incessant poor Jehovah's rain, and Molech's thick fires contending with the rain, thundered above, rolling terrible over their heads. Satan wept over Palamabrum, Theotormon and Brumion contended on the side of Satan. Pitying his youth in beauty, trembling at eternal death. Michael contended against Satan in the rolling thunder. Fulo, the friend of Satan, also reproved him. Faint their reproof. But Rintra, who is the reprobate, of those formed to destruction in indignation, for Satan's soft dissimulation of friendship. Flamed above all the ploughed furrows, angry, red, and furious, till Michael sat down in the furrow, weary, dissolved in tears. Satan, who drave the team beside him, stood angry and dread. He smote Thullo and slew him, and he stood terrible over Michael, urging him to arise. He wept. Any time saw his tears. But love hid Thula from her sight, lest she should die of grief. She wept, she trembled, she kissed Satan, she wept over Michael, she found a space for Satan and Michael and for the poor infected. Trembling, she wept over the space and closed it with a tender moon. Love's secret buried Thula weeping disconsolate over the moony space, but Palamarum called down a great solemn assembly, that he who will not defend truth may be compelled to defend a lie, that he may be snared and caught and taken. And all Eden descended into Palamarum's tent among Albion's truils and baths, in the caves beneath Albion's dead couch, in the caverns of death, in the corner of the Atlantic, and in the midst of the great assembly Palamarum prayed. O oh God, protect me from my friends, that they have not power over me. Thou hast given me power to protect myself from my bitterest enemies. Mark well by words, they are of your eternal salvation. Then rose the two witnesses, Rintra and Palamabrum, and Palamabrum appealed to all Eden and received judgment. And lo, it fell on Rintra in his rage, which now flamed high and furious in Satan against Palamarun, till it became a proverb in Eden. Satan is among the reprobate. Love in his wrath cursed heaven and earth. He rent up nations standing on Albion's rocks among high red through his temples, which reached the stars of heaven and stretched from pole to pole. He displaced continents, the oceans fled before his face, he altered the poles of the world, east, west, and north, and south, but he closed up a determined from the sight of all these things. For Satan, flaming with Rintra's fury, hidden beneath his own mildness, accused Palamarum before the assembly of ingratitude, of malice. He created seven deadly sins, drawing out his infernal scroll, of moral laws and cruel punishments upon the clouds of Jehovah, to pervert the divine voice in his entrance to the earth, with thunder of war and trumpet sound, with armies of the seas, punishments and deaths mustered in number, saying, I am God alone, there is no other. Let all obey my principles of moral individuality. I have brought them from the uppermost innermost recesses of my eternal mind. Transgressors I will rend off forever, as now I rend this accursed family from my covering. Thus Satan raged amidst the assembly, and his bosom grew opaque against the divine vision. The paved terraces of his bosom inwards shone with fire, but the stones becoming opaque give him from sight in an extreme blackness and darkness. And there a world of deeper uro was open in the midst of the assembly. 
in Satan's bosom a vast, unfathomable abyss. Astonishment held the assembly in an awful silence, and tears fell down as dews of night, and a loud, solemn, universal groan was uttered from the east and from the west and from the south and from the north, and Satan stood opaque and measurable, covering the east with solid blackness round his hidden heart, with thunders uttered from his hidden wheels, accusing loud the divine mercy for protecting Palamabron in his tent. Rintra reared up walls of rocks and pulled rivers and moats of fire round the walls. Columns of fire guard around between Satan and Palamabron in the terrible darkness. And Satan, not having the signs of wrath, but only of pity, ran them asunder, and wrath was left to wrath and pity to pity. He sank down a dreadful dead, unlike the slumbers of Bule. The separation was terrible. The dead was reposed on his couch beneath the couch of Albion, on the seven mountains of Rome, in the whole place of the Corbin Carus, Rome, Babylon, and Tyre. A spectre raging furious descended into its space. Then Lodge and then Itarmo knew that Satan is Eurysian, drawn down by orc and the shadowy female into generation. Often Itarmo entered weeping into the space, there appearing an aged woman raving along the streets. The space is named Canaan. Then she returned to Lodge, weary, frightened as from dreams. The nature of a female space is this. It shrinks the organs of life till they become finite, and itself seems infinite. And Satan vibrated in the immensity of the space, limited to those without, but infinite to those within. It fell down and became Canaan, clothing lost from eternity in Albion's cliffs, a mighty fiend against the divine humanity, mustering to war. Satan, ah me, is gone to his own place, said Los. Their God I will not worship in their churches, nor king in their theatres, Elinitria. Whence is his jealousy running along the mountains? British women were not jealous when Greek and Roman were jealous. Everything in eternity shines by its own internal light. But thou darkenest every internal light with the arrows of thy quiver, bound up in the horns of jealousy to a deathly fading moon. And Ocalis binds the sun into a jealous globe that everything is fixed opaque without internal light. So lost lamented over Satan, who triumphant divided the nations. He set his face against Jerusalem to destroy the eon of Alvin. But lost hidden it harmony from the sight of all these things, upon the fence whose lulling harmony repose her soul. Where Beulah lovely terminates in rocky Albion, terminating in Hyde Park, on Tyburn's awful brook. And the mills of Satan were separated into a moony space among the rocks of Albion's temples. And Satan's through its sons offered the human victims throughout all the earth. And Albion's tread turned the mortal on his rock, overshadowed the whole earth, where Satan, making to himself laws from his own identity, compelled others to set him in moral gratitude and submission, being called God, setting himself above all that is called God. And all the spectres of the dead, calling themselves sons of God in his synagogues, worshipped Satan under the unutterable name. And it was inquired, why in a great solemn assembly the innocent should be condemned for the guilty? Then an eternal rose, saying, if the guilty should be condemned, he must be an eternal dead, and one must die for another throughout all eternity. Satan is fallen from his station and never can be redeemed, but must be new created continually, moment by moment. And therefore the class of Satan shall be called the elect, and those of Rintra 
the reprobate, and those of Palamaron the redeemed, for he is redeemed from Satan's law, the wrathful and Gondrintra. And therefore Palamabron dared not to call a solemn assembly till Satan had assumed Gintra's wrath in the day of mourning, in a feminine delusion of false pride, self-deceit. So spake the Eternal, and confirmed it with a thunderous oath. But when Luther, a daughter of Bule, beheld Satan's condemnation, she down descended into the midst of the great solemn assembly, offering herself a ransom for Satan, taking on her his sin. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. And Luther stood glowing with the varying colors, immortal, heart-piercing and lovely, and her moth-like elegance shone over the assembly. At length, Standing upon the golden floor of Palamagon, she spake, I am the author of this sin. By my suggestion, my parent power, Satan, has committed this transgression. I love Palamagon, and I sought to approach his tent. But beautiful Edinitria, with her silver arrows, repelled me. For her light is terrible to me. I fade before her immortal beauty. Oh, wherefore doth a dragon form forth issue from my limbs to seize her newborn son? Ah, me, the wretched Luther! This to prevent entering the doors of Satan's brain night after night, like sweet perfumes, I stupefied the masculine perceptions, and kept only the feminine awake. Hence rose his soft, delusory love to Palamago. Admiration joined with envy, cupidity unconquerable. My fault, when at noon of day the horses of Palamabron called for rest and pleasant death. I sprang out of the breast of Satan, over the harrow beaming in all my beauty, that I might unloose the flaming steeds as Elimitia used to do. But too well those living creatures knew that I was not Elimitia and they break the traces. But me, the servants of the harrow, saw not, but as a bow of varying colors on the hills. Terribly raged the horses. Satan astonished, and with power above his own control, compelled the gnomes to curb the horses and to throw banks of sand around the fiery flaming harrow in labyrinthine forms and brooks between to intersect the metals in their course. The harrow cast flames. Jehovah thundered above. Chaos and ancient night fled from beneath fiery harrow. The harrow cast flames and orders round in concave fires, a hell of our own making. See, its flames still girded me round. Jehovah thundered above. Satan, in pride of heart, drove the fierce harrow among the constellations of Jehovah, drawing a third part in the fires that stubble north and south, to devour Albion and Jerusalem, the emanation of Albion, driving the harrow in pity's path. It was then, with our dark fires which now gird around us, O oh, eternal torment, I formed the serpent of precious stones and gold, Turned poisons on the sultry wastes. The gnomes in all that day spare not. They curse Satan bitterly to do unkind things in kindness with power armed, to say the most irritating things in the midst of tears and love. These are the stings of the serpent. Thus did we by them. Till those they in return retaliated, and the living creatures maddened. The gnomes labor, I weeping hid in Satan's inmost brain. But when the gnome refused to labor more, with blandishments I came forth from the head of Satan. Back the gnomes recalled, and called me sin, and for a sign portentous held me. Soon they sank, and Palamaron returned, 
trembling, I hear myself in Satan's inmost palace of his nervous fine wrought brain. For Elinidria met Satan with all her singing women. Terrific in their joy and pouring wine of wildest power, they get Satan to wine, indignant at the burning wrath. While with prophetic fury his former life became like a dream, clothed the serpent's folds, in selfish holiness demanding purity, being most impure, self-condemned to eternal tears. He drove me from his inmost brain, and the doors closed with their sound. O oh, divine vision, who didst create the female, to repose the sleepers of Thule, Pity the repentant Luther. My sick couch bears the dark shades of eternal death enfolding the spectre of Satan. He furious refuses to repose in sleep. I humbly bow in all my sin before the throne divine. Not so the sick one. Alas, what shall be done him to restore? calls the individual law holy and despises his saviour glory to involve Albion's body in fires of eternal war. Now Luther ceased, tears low, but the divine pity supported her. All is my fault. We are the spectre of Luva, the murderer of Albion. O oh, Vela, O oh, Luva, O oh, Albion, O oh, lovely Jerusalem, the sin was begun in eternity, and will not rest to eternity, till two eternities meet together. Ah, lost, lost, lost forever. So Luther spoke, but when she saw that any Anitarmon had created a new space to protect Satan from punishment, she fled to any Tarmon's tent and hid herself. Loud raging under the assembly, dark and clouded, and they ratified the kind decision of any Tarmon and gave a time to the space, even six thousand years, and sent Lucifer for its guard. But Lucifer refused to die, and in pride he forsook his charge, and they elected Moloch. And when Moloch was impatient, the divine hand found two limits, first of opacity, then of contraction. Opacity was named Satan, contraction was named Adam. Triple Elohim came, Elohim weary fainted, they elected Shaddai, angry, but have descended. By her terrified, they sent Jehovah, and Jehovah was leprous. Loud he called, stretching his hand to eternity, for then the body of death was perfected in hypocritic holiness, around the Lamb, female tabernacle woven in cathedral's looms. He died as a reprobate, he was punished as a transgressor. Glory, glory, glory to the Holy Lamb of God. I touch the heavens as an instrument to glorify the Lord. The elect shall meet the redeemed. On Albion's rocks they shall meet. Astonished at the transgressor, in him beholding the Saviour. And the elect shall say to the redeemed, We behold it is of divine mercy alone, of free gift and election that we live. Our virtues and cruel goodnesses have deserved eternal debt. Thus they weep upon the fatal brook of Albion's river. But Elinitria met Luther in the place where she was hidden, and threw aside her arrows and laid down her sounding bow. She soothed her with soft words and brought her to Palamaron's bed, in moments new created for the Lucian interwoven round about. In dreams she bore the shadowy spectre of sleep and named him dead. 
In dreams she bore Rahab, the mother of Tilsa, and her sisters in Lambeth's Pales, in Cambridge and in Oxford, places of foot, intricate labyrinths of times and spaces unknown, that Luther lived in Palamaron's tent, and Odon was her charming guard. The bar ceased. All considered, and a loud resounding murmur continued round the wolf. And much they questioned the immortal loud voiced bard, and many condemned the high toned song, saying pity and love are too venerable for the imputation of the guilt. Others said, If it is true, if the acts had been performed, let the bards of witness. Where hast thou this terrible song? The bard replied, I am inspired. I know it is truth, for I sing according to the inspiration of the poetic genius, who is the eternal, all-protecting, divine humanity, to whom be glory and power and dominion evermore. Amen. Then there was great murmuring in the heavens of Albion concerning generation and the vegetative power and concerning the Lamb, the Saviour. Albion trembled to Italy, Greece, and Egypt, to Tartary and Hindustan, and China, and to Great America, shaking the roots and fast foundations of the earth in doubtfulness. The loud voice bar terrified took refuge in Milton's bosom. Then Milton rose up from the heavens of Albion, Arturus. The whole assembly wept prophetic, seeing in Milton's face and in his lineaments divine the chase of death and Uro. He took off the robe of the promise and ungirded himself from the old God. And Milton said, I go to eternal death. The nations still follow after the detestable cause of Priam. In pomp of warlike selfhood, contradicting and blaspheming. When will the resurrection come? To deliver the sleeping body from corruptibility. Oh, when, Lord Jesus, will thou come? Tarry no longer, for my soul lies at the gates of death. I will arise and look forth for the morning of the grave. I will go down to the sepulchre to see if morning breaks. I will go down to self-annihilation and eternal death, lest the last judgment come and find me unannihilate, and I be seized and given into the hands of my own selfhood. The Lamb of God is in through mists and shadows, hovering over the sepulchres in clouds of Jehovah and winds of Elohim, a disk of blood, distant, and heavens and earths roll dark between. What do I hear before the judgment, without my emanation, with the daughters of memory, and not with the daughters of inspiration? I, in myself, who am that Satan, I am the evil one. He is my spectre. In my obedience to do him from my hells, to claim the hells, my furnaces, I go to eternal death. And Milton said, I go to eternal death. Eternity shuddered, for he took the outside course among the graves of the dead, a mournful shade. Eternity shuddered at the image of eternal death. End of part one.